Oh my. Um, so listening to you talk about uh, rewilding, uh, you know, uh, is so fantastic. And you can also see how much you just get really excited at the idea of all of this happening. And it, and it really reminds me of the sentence in your book, Feral. And I think I must have like highlighted and underlined it when I crossed, came across it because it resonated so much with me when you said, we know what we're against. Now we must explain what we are for. Uh, and I see this with my students when we talk about climate change. I think you know the, the weight of what what we're describing. It, it's just too much. Often, it's too much for me. Uh, and and you can see the desire, right, for something more positive. Like, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to address this problem? Uh, at the same time, you know, it's kind of harder and harder to kind of feel enthusiastic or optimistic about about our response given where we are now and everything that we've seen. Um, and so I'm curious to hear from you, you know, how would you answer this question now? What are we for? You know, you, it's been a few years since you've written the book. Uh, you know, is rewilding still the answer you give us for what we're for? You know, um, is it important for, for, the, for all the different environmental movements to kind of have a shared vision about what we are aiming for? Uh, and, and if so, you know, uh, what is that? <laughs> what is that vision that you'd want to articulate for us? So we're in a very difficult moment now where so many milestones have been passed so many opportunities to have taken action have not been taken. Global efforts have been impeded, often actually by the US Senate above almost all other forces, I'm afraid to say, um, which again and again has blocked effective action. And it, the window of opportunity does seem to be closing. I mean, just to, I think, put it into context, the situation in which we find ourselves, um, we, we, we've been trying to deal with the Earth's systems as if they were simple ones. You know, so, for instance, we separate out the issues and say, oh, look, there's a climate issue here. Let's deal with that. Put it in a box. Here are some numbers attached to it. We're trying to get the numbers into this place rather than that place. Oh, there's a biodiversity issue as well. Let's put that in another box. Here's some numbers. Let's get the numbers in the right place. Oh, pollution. Oh, soil depletion. Oh, fresh water. You know, we box everything up. Of course, nature doesn't work like that at all. Nothing's boxed up. These, these systems interact, intermingle. Um, none of those boundaries are recognized in nature. They're just boxes that we create for our convenience to try to simplify things and to try to understand them. But it's not just the boxing up. Um, by which we try to simplify these systems. We, we create models of systems which are highly simplified. So if we look, for instance, at, um, at, at climate, we say, well, right, so there's obviously too much carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere. We've got to steadily bring them down to this level. Most nations seem to be converging on net zero by 2050. And if there is um, if we br bring down or keep down the level of CO2 in the atmosphere to below this point, we have a 66% chance of not breaching 1.5 degrees of heating or 2 degrees of heating or whatever it might be. That would work fine if we were dealing with a simple system, like a wash basin, for example, where you have a tap, a faucet, where there's a certain amount of water coming in and you have a plug hole, there's a certain amount of water going out and you slowly turn down the faucet until um, the volume of water coming in is below that of the volume of water coming out. And you can see a gradual progressive linear change taking place there in the level of water in your wash basin. That's how simple systems behave. Complex systems like the climate don't behave like that at all. They absorb stress and often in ways that you can't see. And a classic case with the climate is the oceans absorb heat. And you don't notice it much unless people are out there testing it, taking the temperature as indeed they are. You know, you and I, we don't see the ocean absorbing heat. We don't recognize that this is happening. And these complex systems will absorb stress and absorb stress and manage to maintain equilibrium because they're self-regulating, self-organizing systems until they reach a certain point, which we call a tipping point or a critical threshold. 
And they will suddenly, if you push them past that point, flip in a, in a non-linear way into a completely different equilibrium state. It can happen with extraordinary speed. So, so it's like you're bending a ruler or something and it bends and it bends and it bends and you find, oh, look, it's bending, it's fine. There's no problem, bending, 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 and suddenly it snaps. And instead of one ruler, you've got two halves of a ruler. And, and, and that's, that's how a, a complex systems work. And so they flip into a different state. And once they're flipped, they're subject to something called hysteresis, which means that the energy required to flip them is far less than the energy required to flip them back. So once your system has moved into a different equilibrium state, you're stuck with it. It's not going to move back, certainly not in the human span, in the human term on Earth. Um, and so this idea that we can sort of gradually in a linear, progressive way, reduce emissions and that's going to sort it out. Possibly we'll get there on time. But it seems more likely to me that a system, the system has been absorbing a huge amount of stress already, and it could be close to a tipping point. How do you know it's close to a tipping point? Well, there's a um, pretty solid maths of all complex systems that, um, that when they come close to a tipping point, their outputs flicker. You see ever greater fluctuations in, in, in the variables that those systems produce. That's what we've been seeing. And these, the heat domes over North America, the fires, the, 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 the droughts, um, the, the enormous flooding events that we've seen in Europe, in Africa, in China this year, these look very much to me like flickering. It looks very much to me like systems coming close to their critical thresholds. And of course, it's not just climate we're talking about because these systems work together. And what we're faced with is the prospect of systemic environmental collapse. One system tips and then it tips others and they go down like dominoes, doom, 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 like that. And then we end up in a remarkably short amount of time with an uninhabitable planet. That's what happened with the Permian Triassic boundary um, the end of the Permian period when massive outpourings of carbon dioxide from, from we believe from the Siberian traps um, um, basically flipped the whole system and one Part of that system after another the sort of one subsystem within the earth system went down one after the other so we're in this unbelievably dangerous moment and i don't i don't think one person in a hundred has grasped how dangerous this moment is just how great a hazard we face when we talk about an existential crisis it can't be compared to any existential crisis that hu humankind has faced before i mean we've faced some terrible things horrendous wars and genocides and famines. But as a species, we've come back from those things because they haven't affected all of us or not to a fatal degree, however terrible they've been. But this is on a completely different scale, something else entirely to those. This is, we're talking about the collapse of Earth systems, of our life support systems. And there's absolutely no coming back from that if that happens. So our only hope, I feel, is, is, is radical, systemic, and very rapid change, where we basically try to do what governments did in 2008 to stop the global financial system from collapsing, because it was coming very close to its tipping point in 2008. And they had to pour trillions of dollars into pushing it back into the safe space before it flipped, had it flipped, you know, trillions of dollars wouldn't have worked. We just would have had to wait for the system to evolve over how, how many years, who knows. But, but in this case, we're not making anything like those efforts that were made in 2008. We're facing something far more serious than financial collapse, unimaginable as that must be for many people. Could we turn it around? Well, of course we could. When um, the USA entered the Second World War, it basically turned around the economy in about two months from a civilian economy to a military economy. And factories which had been turning out cars and washing machines and other civilian goods were suddenly turning out fighter planes and amphibious vehicles and missiles and torpedoes. It just, the whole thing was just flipped just like that. And that was before the age of digitization and just-in-time production. 
So this whole idea that we couldn't possibly do it and we can't afford to do it, of course we can do it. Of course we can do it. We've got the capacity, we've got the means to do it, but what's missing is the political will. So this ultimately is a political battle. If we want to rewild the planet, if we want to prevent systemic environmental collapse and rewilding the planet is absolutely essential to that. If we want to prevent climate breakdown, ecological breakdown, humanitarian breakdown, everything breakdown, which is what we're looking at if we flip into an uninhabitable state for planet Earth, then we need to act decisively, radically, rapidly now. And the only thing stopping us only thing stopping that from happening is the lobbying power of legacy, inter legacy interests and legacy industries, which have unfortunately all too great a grip on government. And so our challenge fundamentally is to overthrow plutocracy with democracy. Thanks so much, George. I want to follow up on that really passionate and I think right analysis. Uh, as I'm listening to you, I'm also struck, right, by how those of us who've been paying attention to this topic, I think, uh, have found at the very least uh, that our sleep has been disturbed by what we're reading about and seeing. Uh, and it's at all not reflected in our society at large, right? There's no sense of that alarm <laughs> that I think, you know, anyone who's paying attention should feel. It's just not there. And, and I, I, want to, I want to kind of connect that to something cultural and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. You know, you, you, in your book, you're very critical of the English countryside and, and, it's, and it's simplicity, right? It, it's radical simplicity. Uh, in many ways, it seems like a desert the way you describe it. But I find that sharply contrast to the way that the US audiences are often trained to view the US countryside, right? Uh, in historical drama after historical drama and romantic comedies, the English countryside is a place of pastoral beauty and peace. Uh, I am embarrassed. Well, I'm not even embarrassed. I, I just admit that I'm a big fan of the Great British Baking Show. Uh, and and I, I really enjoy it. But, you know, one of the characteristics of the show is it's many like cutaway scenes where they show like really beautiful pastoral scenes of the English countryside, right? And you see those scenes and, and it, just, it just seems so idyllic. It doesn't square with the vision that you describe of a countryside that's been denuded uh, of its vitality. So how do we reconcile you know, the ways in which like, we've got this huge industry, very popular industry that is shaping our sense of the English countryside to your own characterization of it? is really a place that is environmentally in grave danger. So thanks, Bill. You totally put your finger on it when you said pastoral beauty and peace. Yeah, this, this is the story. And it's, it's such a deep story that I think it qualifies as what the great cultural historian Jeremy Lent calls a root metaphor. Something so deeply imprinted in our minds that we never even recognize it as a metaphor. It's just a channel down which our thoughts flow. And it's a story which goes back a long way. I mean, really to Theocritus in the third century BC, um, writing from, where was he, in Egypt and Alexandria, looking back to his native Sicily and seeing it as this domain of peace and harmony where the shepherds played their pipes under the trees, never did any work, they didn't do any shepherding or anything, but they just uh, lolled about and sang songs and had sex with each other and, and lived in this beautiful idyll, this, this bucolic harmony. And then this, was, this story was picked up to great effect by Virgil, who then transplanted it to Arcadia, um, the, the, the rocky core of the Peloponnese in, in Greece, um, which was the domain of Pan, um, the, the, the god Pan was supposed to live in Arcadia and the shepherds carry on living in, in peace and harmony and they become the pure and innocent alternative to the corrupt cauldron of the city. And so both poets, Theocritus and Virgil, and then many other Greek and Roman poets, create this story that the countryside is, is a place of innocence and purity, 
and, 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 the, and the city is corrupt. And there was a parallel tradition running through the Old Testament that the good people were the shepherds and, and the tillers of the ground were, were the bad people. It was Cain, the tiller of the ground, versus Abel, the shepherd, the, the, the pastoralist. And, and, and the city, well, you know, as Nahum said, the prophet Nahum, woe to the bloody city, the prey departeth not. It was a place of evil. And yet, of course, the people writing the Bible were the descendants of pastoralists who were literate scribes living in the cities. Um, but, you know, they, 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 they were sort of looking back with nostalgia to this imagined idyll, remarkably similar to that of Theocritus and Virgil. And then um, when Virgil comes along, he, he, he writes in, um, I think, his fourth eclogue, this, this remarkable, I mean, what looks like, and certainly the Emperor Constantine saw it this way, as, as, as a remarkable prefiguration of the New Testament story. He said, you know, the, the age of iron will end, the golden age will arrive when this boy turns up and he creates harmony and he basically says the lion will lay, lie, lie down with the lamb. It's, it's incredibly similar. And so Virgil was regarded from Constantine onwards as one of the prophets um, in the Christian tradition. Um, and so you have this meshing of these two very powerful pastoral myths. And of course, Jesus is both the lamb of God, Agnes Dei, and the good shepherd. In the Western church, bishops still carry a crozier, which is in the shape of a shepherd's crook. And then this tradition was picked up big time in Renaissance Europe um, by, by Plutarch onwards, Dante in, in, in a big way, um, and many poets in Italy, Spain and elsewhere. And then it comes to England, um, picked up by Spencer and Marlowe and Shakespeare, who sort of took the piss out of it at the same time in, in, in As You Like It, in this wonderful way in which he sort of builds it up and breaks it down again. Um, and what does Rosalind say? Um, Men have died from time to time and, words, and worms have eaten them, but not for love. You know, just sort of dissing the whole sort of pastoral poetic tradition. But it was deeply embedded in the English soul. And then it gets picked up again in two of the most powerful media of all in, in, in Britain, children's books and Sunday night TV programs. And Sunday night TV programs are basically wall-to-wall -wall sheep. If the BBC were any keener on sheep, it would be illegal. And, and, the, and it's just this sort of, this pastoral idyll rolled out in this massive way. And look at these wonderful people living in harmony with nature and stuff. And, and actually, you know, the sheep is, is the most destructive agent in the whole of the UK. I mean, I worked out that the sheep occupies 4 million hectares of the UK, which is two and a half times the entire urban footprint. It's the same as all the arable land in the UK, and yet it produces just 1% of our calories. And it, you know, if an alien spaceship landed here, um, they, they would assume that the dominant life form in Britain was the sheep. And what it has done is to denude over vast areas of land the entire ecosystem. The trees have all gone because the sheep selectively browse out tree seedlings, which are highly nutritious. Um, and so when the old trees die, there's nothing to replace them. And you get these sort of grass monocultures where almost nothing lives. They are incredibly bare of life. There's no functioning ecosystem of any kind to talk of. There's just basically grass, a couple of herbs which can survive the sheep because the sheep don't like them and a very small number of birds and insects. And there's areas of Britain where you can walk all day and see not a single bird. And yet you go to the city, the cauldron of evil, and there you'll see far more trees per hectare than in those um, sheep wrecked uplands and far more birds and other wildlife. It's, it's quite an extraordinary phenomenon. And yet, you know, still this pastoral idyll particularly promoted by all the children's books, you know, where you've got the rosy cheek farmer with one sheep, one cow, one horse, one dog, one cat, all living together in bucolic harmony. No questions asked about why they may be, might, might be there and what they might be doing and what's going to happen to them, obviously. Um, and then, you know, this TV, this sort of, uh, they don't even ask on these TV programmes how the sheep farmers make their living. It's not from keeping sheep, it's from filling out the subsidy forms on their computers. No one wants to see that. I mean, it's all loss making. No one makes any money at all from, from, from keeping livestock in this country. You just get the money from the government. 
bet you don't see that. George, that was really fascinating. And, and I have to say, like, I've um, been a long fan of English hedgerows because part of my dissertation research was on hedgerows in the United States and California modeled after in many ways the English hedgerows, which are some of the relic woodlands of Great Britain. Um, and people might be surprised to hear when they read in Feral that much of the native ecosystem in Great Britain is this temperate rainforest. Um, really sort of surprising to hear that. And you mentioned that one of our problems is just not having the political will, but also maybe it's a lack of imagination of what was there once and what could be there in the future. And so I guess I'm, I'm curious to know or to tell us a little bit more about those ancient forests. And do you think that the public's imagination for what you describe uh, for wild beasts, um, can that be redirected to imagine the type of ecosystems that are possible in a region um, that's being rewild? And then we're gonna get into some audience questions. We're seeing them coming in, so we're gonna get to your questions, don't worry. So, so this is absolutely the core of the matter because political failure is at heart a failure of imagination. And if you're stuck politically or ecologically or socially, economically, it's because you're not imagining a different world and then bringing that imagination into realization. You know, this is an absolutely key task. And so the role of the poet, the role of the artist, the role, role of the novelist, the role of the creator is absolutely crucial in all of this, imagining a different world. It always has been absolutely fundamental to effective political change. And for me, there's no clear boundary between the role of art and the role of science in determining what better world we, we, we could have. I read scientific papers voraciously. Um, uh, the current book I'm finishing, um, I've read 5,000 scientific papers for it, but at the same time, constantly reading literature, constantly um, reading novels and poetry, because I don't think you can understand the science without getting to the sort of beating heart of what makes humans human and what informs that science and what shapes our imaginative frames and boundaries. And, and yes, it's fundamental that we have to imagine a better world. Otherwise we have no hope even of starting to, to move towards one. And imagining richer ecosystems is crucial to that. And, and, and it is striking. I mean, when I published Feral, rewilding, you know, no one had heard of it. It was a totally marginal thing. I, I was fiercely attacked and criticized from almost all quarters, not, not, not always the ones I expected. Um, and in fact, got some unexpected support, but generally it was considered a completely alien idea. And now it's totally mainstream. I mean, the prime minister, not that this is, uh, should be used as much of a yardstick for anything, but at, at the Conservative Party conference um, um, uh, last week, um, he, he called for rewilding of the United Kingdom. And I mean, it's just, that's how mainstream it's gone, you know, whether you agree with him or not, you know, this is, gone super mainstream and 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 the imaginative process is happening so that gives me some hope that's what you describe makes me want to joke for the people at bc that we should um take the stokes lawn and turn it into a wild space and allow a kind of test plot of forest to grow there if you yeah. ever visit bc you'll know how ludicrous that is but uh, <laughs> well, and how much people really dislike the south lawn because it stands for all the things that you described but um, that, that gets me to, I think, a question that an audience member asked. Are there any dangers with rewilding? How do we make sure that we don't make mistakes if we are going to go down this path, as it sounds like some places really are going all in on? Mm. Well, there's dangers with everything we do. And every single thing a human being does means that some interests are going to be advanced and some interests are, are going to be pushed back. That's, that's just what humanity is, you know, we're, we're, everything is political, everything has consequences, not doing things has consequences, not rewilding has massive dangers. I mean, I would say real genuine existential dangers because of that 
threat of systemic environmental collapse. But obviously there are dangers in rewilding as well. And it has to be done in a way that's socially just. You know, whatever we're dealing with now, it has to be a just transition. It has to be something which generates livelihoods for people. Um, and let's face it, you know, in the countryside, in, in, in rural areas, many traditional li livelihoods just aren't delivering in terms of income, in terms of employment. You know, the, we're seeing real sort of serious social collapse taking place in a lot of places. So if we can create economies built around nature and around um, the, the restoration of nature, well, that would be a fantastic thing because then, you know, we, we see a huge number of people gaining in all sorts of ways. So um, we obviously have to involve people, bring people with us all the time, um, do this democratically, um, but at the same time, fire people up with a vision, you know, in, in, infect them with excitement for what we could have, for how much better things could be. Because for understandable reasons, you know, environmentalists, you know, we've been very good at showing how much worse things could be, but we also have to have that positive vision. We have to be able to explain that things could be better. Otherwise, we won't bring people with us. And I think rewilding is, is, is one way of doing that. Now, you know, I recognize that there is going to be a clash, particularly with livestock farming. I mean, that is the principal clash always. We talk a lot about wildlife human conflicts, but when you look at them, you find that almost all of them are actually wildlife livestock conflicts. You know, why are wolves killed? Why are bears killed? Why, why, why are cougars killed? It's because of livestock. It's not because of their threats, which they present to people. Um, and and so that's a difficult one to negotiate, but it becomes less difficult when you remember that there would scarcely be any livestock keeping anywhere on earth if it weren't for government subsidies. It's government subsidies which keeps that on the road. So as taxpayers, you know, I think we, we all need to be asking ourselves, is this really what we want our money spent on? You know, when you look at the massive environmental impacts of livestock, when you look at the huge amount of land required and the ecological opportunity costs involved in that and the carbon opportunity costs which far outweigh and any any opportunity costs of, of any other rural land use you could possibly imagine because it takes so much land to raise pasture fed meat um, and that land could draw down so much carbon and could host such rich ecosystems if it weren't being used for that purpose then i think the sensible democratic decision is to say, well, our taxes should be used for other purposes. And we're not, you don't have to ban anything. You don't have to impose any new taxes. You just have to stop paying for it out of the public purse. It's a perverse subsidy. And just as we should stop paying for fossil fuels, stop subsidizing fossil fuels out of the public purse, we should stop subsidizing an almost equally damaging industry which is livestock farming. George, thank you so much for that response. Um, we have another question to bring up another element of rewilding on justice. And Aleki Russell asks, um, could you briefly discuss the role of indigenous peoples as stewards of healthy ecosystems and the pattern that's played out worldwide from Scotland to Chile and other locations of privatization of land and eviction um, and then um, Aleki asks, could a radically honest reconciliation process in the UK, for example, set the ball rolling on giving local communities back control for land use? Yeah, well, this is absolutely critical. And I think the two agendas align very well um, with some other people here. I wrote a manifesto called Land for the Many for the Labour Party um, here in the UK, uh, where we're basically trying to reassert common land rights um, here in the UK. Now, uh, we don't have indigenous people in the UK. There's been a huge amount of uh, population um, turnover for a very long time. But in many other parts of the world, particularly driven by our nation, you know, we've invaded countries, pushed out the indigenous people, captured, colonized them, killed vast numbers of people, and then imposed our own ecological change on those places, which tends to be absolutely devastating in ecological terms. 
So in Scotland, where um, a lot of this kicked off, the, the Highland Clearances um, in 1745 basically replaced a very complex ecosystem with sheep ranches. Similar things then were done in South America by then, of course, the British and other European nations had um, attacked both people and place across the Americas um, with devastating, you know, tens of millions of people were killed or died of disease. A lot of them slaughtered deliberately, a lot more died of disease or died of starvation, being driven out of their lands, as you know, uh, and absolute devastation was wrought on ecosystems. And so the, the, the protection, the recognition, the restoration of indigenous people's rights is absolutely crucial, but also the establishment of community rights to land, I think is really, really important because after all, how did we get to the situation where a person could own vast tracts of land, stopping anyone else from using that land? I mean, no one made it. It's, it's a fundamental question which has come up in every generation. People have asked this, how, how can someone own all that land? And there's never a good answer to it. You know, if you challenge a landowner, you say, how come, well, well, my, my father owned it. Well, yeah, but how, how did he get it? And how did your grandfather get it? Well, they killed someone generally, or they bought it off someone who had killed someone or killed a lot of people. And, and there's never a good justification for it. And so, you know, I think we should ask these difficult and radical questions. Like, and, and, and there are ways of bringing back community land ownership. And in fact, in Scotland, uh, though not in the rest of the United Kingdom, but in Scotland that's happening in quite an exciting way with the community right to buy, where communities are now buying very large tracts of land. There's um, one um, currently buying 10,000 acres to rewild of land which has been used as an aristocratic sporting estate for shooting grouse and deer and cleared of all its trees and devastated. They want to bring nature back, but they also want to bring the people back and the people's economy rooted in the land back, but a different economy, an economy based on the restoration of nature. And I think there's a great deal of hope in that model. Thinking about the concentration of land ownership, and I just read recently that uh, Bill Gates apparently has been buying up huge tracts of farmland in, in the Midwest and the central parts of the US. And just thinking about what it means that one person can own so many acres of land. Um, it could connect, I think, to a lot of the questions we've been getting about economics, you know, uh, and in particular about neoliberalism. So I wonder if you have any thoughts about neoliberalism oh, well, <laughs> and, uh, and, and its connections to what we were talking about. <laughs> well, I mean, let's take it back, back a bit further because, you know, neoliberalism is, is an aspect of capitalism, a particularly extreme aspect, which really kicked off with um, um, Friedrich Hayek's book, The Road to Serfdom in 1944, and then sort of became globalized through the Mont Pelerin Society starting in 1947. But let's take this back a bit further to the dawn of capitalism. Now, this is a word which you know, you're not really supposed to say, you know, it's like, it's like mentioning God in the Old Testament. You weren't supposed to say the word. It's, it's, it's sacrosanct, but we need to say it. We need to ask ourselves, what exactly is this thing? And if you stop someone in the street and say, what's capitalism? You know, the system which completely dominates our lives. Most people would really struggle to say, would really struggle to come up with a definition. They'd say, oh, it's about buying and selling, hard work and enterprise. And stuff. But actually it's a really interesting and strange and novel system, which in, the way that we would, um, in, 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 well, it really kicked off in about the 1450s. And, and, it, and something happened, began happening then, which was unlike any economic system which had happened before. And it really started on the island of Madeira, which was first colonized by the Portuguese in 1420. And it was called Madeira because it had lots of wood, which is uh, in Portuguese, um, wood is Madeira. And, um, and uh, the colonists were very attracted by this prospect. They started cutting down the forests and then they realized they could make money from growing sugar. So they imported sugar onto the island, sugar cane, and then they brought slaves from the Canary Islands and from Africa to, to, to grow that sugar cane. 
And they then got financed by merchants, by, by bankers in, in Genoa and Flanders to grow that sugar cane. And they began to develop a system which was materially different from anything that had happened before. And it was a system which was characterized first, as Karl Polanyi would point out, by the commodification of land, labor and money, those three crucial pillars which distinguish capitalism, but also by the creation of a fire front, which raged across Madeira. It's basically, it was um, a remarkably rapid transition, um, ecological transition took place as this very rich ecosystem was turned into sugarcane plantations, and then huge amounts of the forest, the Madeira, was cut down um, to stoke the boilers required to extract and refine the sugar, um, leading to extinctions within a very few years, and then leading to the complete collapse of the industry. Uh, it peaked in, what, 1506, I think, and had more or less collapsed and had fallen by 80% by 1520 because they'd exhausted the resources. And then they did that thing which capitalism has done ever since. They abandoned it and moved on. First to the island of San Tomé, and then to Brazil, and then to the Caribbean, and all the time burning through the land, literally burning through it in this case, and moving on, abandoning and moving on. Boom, bust, quit. Boom, bust, quit. quit. And that is one of the, the fundamental characteristics of capitalism, which makes it different from previous systems. Sure, lots of previous systems destroyed ecosystems, but nowhere near as quickly as capitalism did. And it's still doing it around the world. Um, and we see that fire front, that literal fire front, in some of the last unexploited places in, in, in the Amazon, in West Africa, in West Papua, for example, ripping through the forests, extracting the, the, the valuable commodities, um, massive exploitation of labor, um, the, three, the three commodities, um, Carl Polanyi's commodities, but also the fire front, those two crucial characteristics of capitalism. We see it at work. We see it heading towards the deep ocean floor, we see Jeff Bezos talking about going into space because they're running out of fronts. They're running out of frontiers to exploit. And we also see all sorts of virtual frontiers being created for this and the fire front burning through people, place, resources, earth systems. And the reason we're approaching systemic um, environmental collapse is that those fire fronts have converged that basically converged across the world because we've seen the globalization of that system which started in the 1450s on the island of Madeira. And then neoliberalism has been an accelerant for this fire. It, it's, it's basically said we strip away all the, the things which slow that down. We strip away all the, the, the social inhibitions, the cultural inhibitions, the political inhibitions, and we leave it entirely to this thing it calls the market. Um, politics has to be pushed out of the way. It, it, it has no valid role. The, the only way in which the validity of humankind must be discerned, of humankind must be discerned is, is how well they do in this thing we call the marketplace. Um, whether they, whether you, 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 you fail or survive, in that marketplace. And everything which can inhibit what they consider to be pure competition, such as taxes, such as regulation, such as trade unions, need to be swept out of the way in order to allow this red in tooth and claw market relations to be pursued. Now, of course, it's absolutely bounded by hypocrisy and double standards. Friedrich Hayek went on to write a book called The Constitution of Liberty, in which he basically said, rich people are good, full stop, regardless of whether they earn the money or inherited the money, and we should just clear a path for those rich people to do whatever they want. So, so contradicting the fundamental tenets of neoliberalism, which is that it's a meritocracy, the best people win. No, the rich people win, which of course was why the Mont Pelerin Society was so lavishly funded from the beginning by some of the richest people and corporations in the world and then pushed out in so many academic institutions and by think tanks and, and the rest of it. And so we end up with a system where it becomes very hard to resist what capitalism is doing. And again, we suffer from a failure of imagination and we need a new imaginative effort 
to see a different system. And, and I, I, I think I've sort of began to sketch one out and, and my own mind, other people have done so. Yeah, I don't claim to have a monopoly on this by any means at all, but I feel I'm groping towards something different, which I call private sufficiency, public luxury. That there's not enough ecological space for everyone to pursue private luxury. There's simply not even enough physical space. You know, if we all tried to have our own swimming pool and tennis court and art collection and playground for the kids and stuff, I mean, London would cover half of England, England would cover the whole of Europe. You know, where would everyone else live? You know, it's just impossible. There'd be no room for nature, no room for each other. Um, there's, it's just, it's not feasible. Uh, the only reason some people can be so rich is that other people aren't. But we can all have luxury if it's in the public domain. We can have wonderful public swimming pools and public tennis courts and public transport and public health systems and, and public community centres and public parks and luxury. Wonderful, wonderful things which don't cost the earth and don't exclude other people. That was wonderful. Um, I have so many questions related to that. I wanna kind of ask you two of them. The first one we've talked so much, or you've talked about the ecological degradation for, of capitalism. And also sustainability is often described in ways of what we give up and what we might be losing from our lifestyle of consumption. But we don't typically talk about what we have to gain by living in a more biologically rich ecosystem and allowing ecosystems to thrive and giving them the space and, and to other species. Um, so one question I just wanna ask is, is, what does rewilding human life mean in the 21st century in modern societies? And then related to this, this uh, question, many people are asking what they can do as people who live in the city, as people who feel removed from an ecosystem, how can they be engaged in, in this movement? Well, the first thing to say is we absolutely don't have to give up our urban lives. You know, actually city living is pretty sustainable and there's a lot of good in it. And it's where a lot of political change happens. So you know, I'm in no way against city living, but you know, I do want there to be beautiful, rich ecosystems for us to escape into when we want to get away from city living. And to the greatest extent possible, I want to see those ecosystems fingering into the cities. And the best way of doing that is along the river corridors, because of course all cities are built along rivers and the rivers connect those cities to the whole hinterland, literally to the whole catchment, all the way up to the mountains. And rivers are fantastic corridors down which wildlife can travel and along which humans can move as, as well. And, and you see that when rivers are allowed to come back to life, an amazing flux of wildlife beginning to come into them and people having great wildlife experiences, even sometimes right in the heart of the city where you see amazing creatures just popping up out of the water, um, much more so on the whole than on land. And, and so I think by you know, rewilding urban rivers, reconnecting them, taking away the obstacles like the weirs and dams on them, which stop this wonderful movement of fish and many other species, the otters and the beavers, whatever it might be, um, moving up and down. That, that you know, is something which urban people can directly participate in. But we also need places to escape from our gridded, over-organized, over-managed lives. You know, when we're kids, we very small kids, we're discursive in our approach. You'll see a parent with a very small kid, you know, anyone who's been a parent will know, you know, what this is like. You say, no, 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 walk this way. Come, come here. No, we're going over there. We're not going there. No, we're not doing that. So, no, 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 no. Focus on this. You know, you're constantly trying to bring your kids and march them along a line, literally. You know, if you're trying to get to, to the shops or get to school or something, you know, you walk, walk in a particular direction. This is where we're going. We're going from A to B. And, and all those other places that you find interesting and that dog over there and, and that, that truck going past, that those are irrelevant because we're going in this direction. And, and, you, um, and, and, and so you discipline your children and you discipline yourself into a linear life, which you know, works, it's functional, it's efficient, but we lose something in, in doing so. And, and we lose the poetry of life 
and the art of life and the beautiful discursive nature of life and the sort of spont spontaneity of life and the discovery of life. And I think we should try to recover some of what we've lost. And nature allows us to do that in a way that almost nothing else does because when you've got a rich and functioning ecosystem, it doesn't play by the rules. It doesn't behave in linear ways. It, it's, it's not incremental. It's not, um, it, it's not gridded in the same way as the rest of our lives are. It, because it's a complex system, it behaves in emergent and adaptive ways, in self-organized ways. And when you immerse yourself in nature and you're embedded in nature, you constantly stumble across the unexpected. You, know, you might go out and say, right, today I want to see a long-tailed duck. And you'll go out with your binoculars to see a long-tailed duck. And if you're in a rich, thriving ecosystem, you might not see a long-tailed duck, but you might see half a dozen other things which are just as exciting as a long-tailed duck which you weren't expecting to see. And you might see the animals behaving in some interesting way that you'd never seen before. And you might have some amazing, totally out of the box wildlife experience, which you just couldn't imagine before you had it. And I think this can greatly enrich our lives and make them richer and rawer and tap into what I see as our ghost psyche. As anyone who's worked with indigenous people, and I spent six years working with indigenous people on three continents. As anyone like that knows, other people have capacities which we in our urban lives don't have. And we doubtless have capacities which they don't have because you all train your brain in different ways and you emphasize certain things. And um, Working with the Turkana people in Northwestern Kenya, um, I found that they had memory. They could perform feats of memory without even thinking about it that seemed supernatural. I mean, it's just like, how can a human brain possibly do that? You know, remember the names of 10,000 people, literally 10,000 people and all their ancestors and all the relations between them. And they could do that because their entire culture was an oral culture and it depended on trust and that trust had to be built by knowing everyone and everything about them and being aware of all the incredibly complex relations. And they could do that because that's where they were focused. They could also count a herd of cattle without counting. So they could look at like 250 cattle and say, one's missing, and they would know which one it was immediately. You know, just look at it. And, and, and I said, how do you do that? But then, you know, they might see me doing what I do, writing my column for The Guardian or something, and say, how do you do that? You know, because we're just trained in different ways. But, you know, by, by specializing, we, we lose other faculties. And some of the faculties we've lost, I think almost all human beings have lost, which are the faculties required to survive when we were completely embedded in nature. And I've had moments where I feel I've had a glimpse. It's like a bit of the brain has just woken up and gone ping, a bit which I never knew existed. And I've had feelings which are so rich and immersive and raw and feral that I haven't known what to do with them. You know, it's just, oh, well, what's this? Where's it come from? Who am I? Who am I? I'm having these incredible feelings. And it's always happened when I've had some amazing, unexpected encounter with nature. A uh, classic example, when I was out of my kayak off the coast of Wales, which is, you know, again, a very depleted marine ecosystem. And this bull dolphin jumped clean over my head, just out of nowhere. It just came straight over my head as it was going back down into the water. This was a 13 foot bottle nose dolphin, same length as my kayak. It looked back and for this split second, we just looked into each other's eyes just before it hit the water. And it was like, it's like, who am I now? I am someone different to the person I was a second ago because something has fired in my brain which has just made me see the world in a new way. And it's still there, it's still there today. George, we've uh, gone over, but I do wanna ask one last question. Uh, and I wanna take you right to the end of the book, uh, Feral, where you say, wherever I went, I would take that wildlife with me. That, that sense of, you know, as, as I think you've been speaking eloquently just now about, you know, how that encounter with the dolphin has changed you. You know, you've taken that wildness with you. And, 
fundamentally altered your life. But what can people who don't have the kind of job that would allow them to travel or to the resources to visit such wild ecosystems, what can people like that do to make that kind of ecological conversion to have that kind of experience in the wild? Because it does seem like just on its own, that's very valuable. Uh, this is this is an entirely valid question. And, and so this is why I want to bring wildlife to us as much as us to wildlife. Uh, you know, I don't want to rewild human life, but I also want us to have the opportunity to engage with much richer ecosystems than we usually can without having to fly halfway around the world, because obviously flying halfway around the world is simply not compatible with protecting a thriving planet. And, and so bring, bring the wildlife to us, you know, let, let's have it on our doorsteps. And, and so, and I think by, by you know, the mass restoration of nature as close to cities as possible, and on the largest possible scale is, can be of immense benefit to people. You know, give you that escape valve, that hatch where you can climb into a different world. It's like passing through the portal into another kingdom. And, and, and that sense of escape, which I think is absolutely a fundamental human need, almost a human right, just time to time, just, Get away from it, get away from it all, leave it all behind and, and immerse yourself in a different world. That is something that we can create. We can, can have that on our doorsteps. We need two things for that. First of all, we need to keep cities compact. And I think there are very good reasons for keeping cities compact, not least the functioning of the city itself. If cities are compact, the services work much better whether it's public transport or sewerage or gas mains, whatever it might be, they tend to be much more functional. Um, you, you have to travel less to get to work, to get to the shops. You know, I'm talking about high urban density being a good thing in this respect. But also it means you don't just sprawl out over the surrounding land and you can allow nature to, to come back close by. And then you know, when you wanna see nature, it's there, it's there on your doorstep, and you can have these really rich and, 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 and engrossing um, experiences in, in a beautiful place. Um, and I think there's something very special about doing it in your own backyard. You know, I've, I've been lucky enough because I've worked abroad so much um, uh, when I was younger um, to have amazing wildlife experiences around the world, but actually. I find the richest ones are the unexpected wildlife experiences round the corner. Um, and so, for instance, so in here in Oxford, which is, you know, a city like any other in some ways, I mean, it's a great city, but it's also you know, a city. Um, we've, we've got urban goshawks, which is completely unexpected. I don't think anyone else I know of in the UK has got urban goshawks. When I first saw one flying across my garden, it was like, it was as if I'd seen a giraffe. It was so unexpected. It was just the weirdest thing. And, and I couldn't quite believe it. It wasn't really till I saw a second one flying over my house being mobbed by gulls that I thought, we've really got urban goshawks. It's amazing. And then I realized they were nesting and I saw one carrying a baby gull to its nest and again being mobbed. And it's just like, this compares to any wildlife experience I've had anywhere because it's here because it's on my doorstep, because this magnificent creature has come back to where I live. And, and that's like a gift to me. It's like a wonderful, thrilling thing which has been brought to me by nature. And nature has enriched my life right here. And that means more than any experience elsewhere. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, George. That was so that was so beautiful. I, and it brought me back over the weekend. I just wanted to share one little story because you mentioned about a portal to another world. And I had my son, we were out at a park and we ducked into the edge of the park into a wooded habitat. And it was all enclosed and we were under the canopy and exploring there was a creek there and no one was there and everyone was playing ball and doing other things in the park and it felt like a secret world to ourselves and it was really quite beautiful but in a very urban environment 
Um, I just wanna personally thank you, George, so much for the wisdom that you've shared with us, for your incredible work with The Guardian and all the books that you share with the world. For those who haven't read Feral, we know you're gonna go out and get it now. It's just a wonderful book and has so much to, to share with us now in these times when we so critically need to restore our ecosystems and to restore our human population into something that's healthy and um, flourishing. And Min, I'm gonna give you the last word. I don't know if I could follow up <laughs> with what you've just said or what George has said. I mean, this has been such a gift, George, and I feel certainly uplifted. I, I, I was just telling someone that yesterday I had all this work to do and, 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 and I didn't do as much as I wanted because I felt kind of overwhelmed by the, you know, by the just general awfulness of the world uh, and, and the news. Uh, and, and it just is such a lovely thought that, uh, you know, just even hearing you talk about your experiences in the wild, thinking about your encounters with animals and, and vegetation, it just, it, it, it made me think back about, you know, the things that I value and, and the experiences that I've had um, and, and, and how it, it, it does offer a sense of solace and replenishment at a time when we so need it. And maybe, you know, the forest can guide us yet again to a future that we would all want to live in. So I want to thank you, George, really. Thank you so much. Thank you, Min. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Really great to meet you. Have a good great evening, everyone. Well. And get out into nature wherever you find it. Bye-bye. <laughs> Take everyone. care. Bye -bye. You too. Bye-bye, everyone.